Okay, welcome everyone to a new case study breakdown. Just going to get everyone in, make sure everyone's good. Let's see. Right on. People are filing in, figuring it out. Right on. Okay. Well, thank you for joining me for the breakdown of this class. I've got a few props that I'm just organizing here, make sure that's all good. Um, so we're going to be talking about myocardial infarctions, particularly inferior myocardial infarctions that are affecting the right coronary artery. Uh, so that's what we're going to be covering today. So I'm looking forward to bringing some, um, some information about that particular uh, myocardial infarction because there's a lot of controversy with certain things. And I'm going to teach you the understanding of kind of why those controversies occur. Uh, so while everyone's kind of filing in here, kind of getting in the notifications that we're going live, what I'd like to do now is just simply see where you guys are all from. Go ahead, throw it in the comments where you guys are watching from, uh, where in the world are you? I'd love to know so that way I can kind of figure out what is up. Hey, Andrew, it's good to see you. Edmonton. Bay Area. Maine, England, Washington, Surrey, Canada, North Carolina, Jordan, Malaysia, India, Miami, Belize, very cool, upstate New York, California, Canada, Saskatchewan, um, DC, hey, you got your flight job, congratulations, that's a, a huge feat, congrats on that. So children's in DC, maybe, so you might be doing just pure pediatrics, which would be really cool. Austin, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, New Mexico, Georgia. Oh my gosh, okay. Lots of our US friends here, which is awesome to see. Okay. Philippines, India, awesome. Super cool. It's always uh, a very, um, in, it's always an interest to me. You guys know that if you guys have been into my classes before. So um, let me just change the settings on my camera here because they look like they're going funky. Uh, there we go. I should do the trick. Okay, so let's chat about myocardial infarctions. Make sure I get a good recording of this too, huh? There's a lot of things to remember to get going. All right. Okay, so let's talk about our inferior myocardial infarctions. Let's go through the case uh, and talk briefly about that. If you don't know who we are or have just to kind of get introduced to uh, Master Medics. Master Medics is a, an online service. We have a premium service that some of our members are watching from right now. In order to get insider information about some of these things, we kind of do a little bit more for them. We also provide an entire library of courses that are one continuing education improves the, all over the world, as well as student based courses. So that way you can get in there and start to understand medicine in a way that you need to as a student so that way you can get past your licensing exams and onto an ambulance with what's most important, confidence. And that's what we do is that we provide that confidence. We give you the knowledge, we give you the expertise that we're providing uh, through ourselves so that way you guys can feel good about walking on an ambulance and feel good about working with patients. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out on a free day, free trial, see if it's for you. If it's for you, you can stay as long as you like. If it's not, then you can cancel at any point. Okay, so let's take a look at this case. You're dispatched to a private residence for a female patient complaining of shortness of breath and back pain. This is your patient here. You arrive to find the patient on two liters of oxygen. They are on HOMO2 for COPD. She is conscious and alert, but in obvious distress. She says she has vomited three times in the last half hour. Okay, so that's what we've got. This is the presentation of our patient. Okay, obviously quite fatigued, quite short breath, not feeling too well. Let's get an in-depth look at a couple of our things. So first off, our vitals. 
So our heart rate is 118, looks like a sinus tac. We have P waves, we have QRSs that are narrow, so sinus tachycardia. We have an SpO2 of 93%, good pleth. Okay, we have a respiratory rate of 24, and we have a blood pressure of 141 on 87. Okay, your partner gets you an ECG. Okay, but I guess one of the first things I want to ask you is, first off, based on these vital signs, is your patient compensated or decompensated right now? Okay, we know they're in cardiogenic shock. It's a pretty good guess, or at least we have a pretty good idea. But are they compensating right now or are they decompensating? Go ahead and put that in the comments. What do you think? Compensated, compensated, decom, compensated, compensated, compensated. Okay. So at this point, I would agree with you is that this patient currently, based on the vital signs, they are in a compensated state of cardiogenic shock. Okay. Compensated state of decardiogenic shock. That's what we know so far. So your uh, partner ends up getting you an ECG. Okay, so I'll leave this up here. I'll try and focus it again on my camera so you can get a good look at it and view it up very nicely. Okay, so what do you see in this ECG? Anything that jumps out at you, go ahead and put it in the comments. Okay, what do you see in this ECG? Gonna see what you guys think. Duck under. Mm -hmm. Inferior STEMI elevation in two three ABF STEMI STEMI inferior STEMI elevation two three ABF. Okay, ignore V four R for a moment. I want you to just look at the main stuff. Lead two, not one. Okay. Why is it? compensated well it's compensated because a uh, shock is all due to perfusion and perfusion is calculated by our systemic blood pressure and our blood pressure was in the 140s and our map was over 70 and so this patient is compensating because they're able to compensate and maintain perfusion and we can see that by the elevation of our blood pressure Okay, so you guys are on the right track. So what you're seeing here is that you're seeing elevation in leads two, okay? And ABF particularly, you probably could argue that you have about a millimeter of elevation in lead three as well uh, above your isoelectric line, okay? So just judging by this ECG alone, we have elevation in lead three, Okay, lead three, we have about one mil. Okay, we have about two and a half. Okay, we'll just round down two mils in lead two. And then we have about a mil and a half, almost two mils, two mils in this one for sure. Okay, so we have more than enough evidence to suggest that we have elevation in two, three and a half. There's actually another lead that I like to look at as well in a inferior MI when I'm suspecting it, uh, which is actually not V4R, it's another one, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment as well. But you guys are correct. You guys are looking at the same stuff I am. You see elevation 2, 3, AM. That's the easy part, okay? That's the easy part of this ECG. So let's look at this from a physiological standpoint, because it's all nice to see it on an ECG, but what does it actually mean? Well. Just to give you a reference, okay, lead two, okay, this lead right here is looking at this portion of the heart, okay, so it's staring directly at more of the septal areas of the heart like so. Okay, I'll change the color. Lead three, okay, is actually more looking at this portion, okay, of the inferior portions of the heart. Okay, and then finally, ABF, okay, is looking almost directly into the middle, like so. And so that's why these three combine to be your inferior leads. And by inferior, they're talking about 
uh, looking at it from this direction, flat on the heart, they're actually looking at it from the bottom. So what these three leads combined to look at is actually this portion of the heart, okay? The bottom portions of the heart, not the front, the bottom portions. And the bottom portions predominantly, okay, are going to be, for the most part, this right ventricle, part of the septum, and a little bit of the inferior portions of the left, left ventricle. Okay, but for the most part, it's going to be predominantly the septum and the right ventricle that are going to be um, lacking oxygen. They're going to be um, they're going to be hypoxic. Okay, now I told you about another lead that I like to look at, and that is AVL. Okay, AVL. Now in this particular one, it is not. Uh, showing the signs that you would often see in an inferior myocardial infarction. Now, to give you a reference, AVL, okay, is up here, okay, and it's looking directly at this left ventricle here, or sorry, left atrium, left ventricle, like the very top portions here, okay? So if you had an infarct this high, like say a high left circumflex, then it would have s &T elevation. In an inferior myocardial infarction, however, it's actually looking directly through the heart like so. And so you can get AVL reciprocal changes that show s and depression, okay? Okay, s and depression. In fact, you can see s and depression very often before you start to see s and elevation in 2, 3, and AVF. Just to go back here again, is that the reason AVL is so handy and why it sees that is that it's directly looking at this lateral wall of that right ventricle. So if you have s and depression in AVL, you likely have a good portion of that muscle that's affected. Okay, so don't... Um, it's actually a very useful lead. It's one of the leads. It's actually the lead that I look at first over 2, 3, and AVF. Okay? And that is simply because it's often early and it's often very addictive of an inferior myocardial infarction because of its direct view at that lateral wall, the right ventricle. Okay? So... That's the physiological things that we're actually looking at. So let's talk about the what's happening inside the heart. I'm just going to make sure you guys are on track here. You guys are good. Good, 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 good. Right on. Okay. So the when you have an inferior myocardial infarction, you're typically dealing with the right coronary artery. Okay, or what we call the RCA, okay, that's going to be blocked somewhere along its track. Now, the right coronary artery kind of wraps around like so and moves like so. <clears throat> so this right coronary artery is not only feeding this right ventricle and part of the septum, it's also feeding the SA node, it's also feeding the AV node, and so it's feeding a lot of the electrical components that drive our heart rate. So it's not unusual, luckily in this case it didn't happen, but it's not unusual to see bradycardia in an inferior myocardial infarction, simply because the RCA being a common, being the most common vessel blocked in an inferior myocardial infarction, about 80%, okay? And most patients get their SA node and AV blood supply from the RCA. Okay, so if your blockage is high enough in your RCA, then there is a chance that you will see bradycardia due to that. <clears throat> and we'd have to deal with that. Okay, but in this case, we don't. We have tachycardia, which means that we're likely dealing with a blockage lower down. Okay, so physiologically speaking, what happens in an inferior myocardial infarction is that the right ventricle is predominantly affected and it would be varying degrees of it being affected. Meaning that just because you have an RCA blockage, that doesn't mean that that right coronary artery or sorry, that right ventricle is just useless. Okay. 
There is possibilities as getting collateral circulation from branches of the descending left anterior. It's also possible that there is branches from the right coronary artery that are unaffected. Okay, so it is possible that that right ventricle is still working in some capacity. It doesn't mean that we need to um, go all out and be worried about significant hypotension. That might come later, but right now we're dealing with a ventricle that still has some capacity of workload. Okay, so what happens if you kind of think of this water bottle as that right ventricle? Okay, when you, we don't have a blockage and we have a completely clear RCA, we have a ventricle that's able to use all of its muscle to squeeze. So that's like using my whole hand in order to squeeze water out like so. Okay, but in a inferior myocardial infarction, when you have a blockage in that RCA, we're reducing the ability to squeeze that muscle, which means that instead of using our whole hand, to squirt out water, we're now left with a couple fingers to try and squirt out that same water, which is a lot harder to do. And that muscle fatigues because we're over capacity. So that's kind of the issue here is that we're now with that blockage, we're not able to use all of our muscle of our right ventricle to squeeze. We're now stuck with a finger or two, okay? A lack of muscle that can actually be used to move blood forward. Okay, so that's going, that's what the problem is with this inferior myocardial infarction. That right ventricle not being able to move blood forward because it's having a reduction of muscle that can be used for squeeze. Okay, so let's get into some of the treatment now that we know the ECG portions, we know the physiology portions. Now let's talk about some of this treatment. Now, the first thing that we should be thinking about in a myocardial infarction is oxygen. Now, based on the vital signs, do you feel this patient needs a significant increase in oxygen? Okay, or based on the vital signs, and I should say vital signs and presentation, do you feel this patient requires oxygen? What do you think? No. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I would be inclined to agree with people that are saying yes. I agree that the SATs are good. They're 93%. Okay. Saturation is good right now. However, the presentation of our patient is diaphoretic, fatigued, and short of breath. Okay, and so in a myocardial infarction, okay, typically we're not giving oxygen to someone that has an SpO2 of 93, 94 and above because there's a direct correlation or no direct correlation to increase or decrease mortality with oxygen for patients that are not experiencing hypoxia. However, this patient is short of breath they're in respiratory distress. And we're not gonna withhold oxygen in this patient if they're short of breath, if they're in requiring oxygen demand, requiring ventilation. And so in this particular patient, yes, our number looks okay, but our presentation does not. And so in this particular case, I think you're absolutely warranted in giving oxygen because your patient is short of breath, okay? So that's the first thing. But however, if this patient was not short of breath and they did have a 90% or 94% oxygen saturation and they weren't experiencing shortness of breath, then yes, oxygen is, could be withheld in that particular case because there's no indication that's needed. But in this particular case, with shortness of breath, it is. Okay, so that's the first thing. Okay. And just going back to this, that kind of shows us that our patient is in respiratory distress, okay? And we don't withhold oxygen in patients that are in respiratory distress. Just simple as that. And I know our number is good, but number is one thing, presentation is a whole other thing. And that would be the thing that I would kind of take the whole picture in to make your clinical decision. Okay, so let's go into the other portions of treatment. Okay, other portions of treatment.
So the two things that we're going to talk about, obviously, if this patient is experiencing a myocardial infarction, ASA, acetylic acid is your go-to. Okay? That needs to be given. Okay? So make sure you are giving your ASA. That's an easy hit, okay, on as far as treatment goes and as far as a goal. This is the only medication truly that has shown to improve or reduce the mortality at an infarct size in a myocardial infarction is this medication right here. All the other medications are kind of like a nice to have, truly. This medication here actually is proven to work. So let's get into the controversial one, nitroglycerin. Okay, let's talk about this one. Because this is the one that gets hung up on everything. And so before I get into my breakdown, what are your thoughts on giving nitroglycerin to this myocardial infarction patient that has showing signs of an inferior myocardial infarction? Should we give nitroglycerin to this patient or should we withhold it in this patient? Go ahead, throw it in the comments. The, BC, the blood pressure was 140. V4R had uh, no elevation. Withholding depends on systolic pressure. The systolic pressure is 140. Heart rate is 138. This is a STEMI patient. You could, but use it with caution. I would give it, give nitro, give, give, give. Yes, depends on BP, give it because of the BP. If there's no right ventricular infarction with hypotension, we can use it. Okay. So let's talk about nitroglycerin as a whole. Okay, and so that way we can kind of understand what it's doing. I'm just gonna get the bowl out so I don't make a mess. Okay, so nitroglycerin in itself is a vasodilator, particularly on the venous side. So what we're doing inside the heart, okay, is we're dilating these vessels that are returning blood back to this right ventricle. Remember, the right ventricle is the one that particularly is affected in this particular case, okay? The right ventricle in itself is not a very muscular chamber. It's more of a large chamber with thinner walls as opposed to the left ventricle that has really thick walls with a smaller chamber itself, okay? So what does that mean from a physiological standpoint? It means that the right ventricle is what we would call preload dependent, meaning it requires a lot of fluid in order to fill it up, okay? And that's represented here with this fluid here. And there's a few things that can affect preload. And one of those things that affects preload is blood return back to the heart. So if we use nitroglycerin in a patient that is struggling to move blood from the right ventricle forward because it's, it's, we have less muscle, then we're going to have more preload issues. So in this case, when we cause vasodilation using nitroglycerin, we're decreasing the amount of blood in that right ventricle with every squeeze. Okay, so I'm not saying that's what's going to happen with this particular patient because their pressures are good. doesn't look like they have a lot of right ventricular involvement here. So I'm not particularly convinced that we're going to see a significant drop in blood pressure if we give nitro to this patient. However, this is particularly why nitroglycerin is controversial because the mechanism and the pathophysiology kind of butt heads. So should you give nitroglycerin to this patient? You could trial it. Okay. You could try it and see what happens. Okay. But there's really not a lot of reason to give it in this particular case. 
Okay, why do we give it to left-sided? It's because we're trying to reduce preload to help the afterload pressure issues that we have in a left ventricular failure. Okay, we don't have those same problems in inferior myocardial infarctions. Okay, so can you give nitro? Yes, I don't think that there's anything to suggest that you can't in this particular case, because we don't see any right ventricular involvement, regardless of the fact that we have an inferior. We don't see any de, uh, significant hypotension or anything like that. And so follow your protocols by all means. And so if you have a protocol in place that says if you have a myocardial infarction that shows inferior involvement, don't give nitro, then don't give it because you can't go against your protocols that are set in place. However, a lot of evidence is suggesting that our fear with nitroglycerin in inferior myocardial infarctions was misplaced is that there is not nearly as much concern as we once thought. Okay, so that's kind of the issue. Now, could you give it? Sure. But like I said, there's really no huge purpose in giving it in, a, in an inferior myocardial infarction. Okay, like I said, you don't have an afterload problem with this heart. Okay, you have a preload issue predominantly with that right ventricle. And so is there a reason that nitro could benefit this patient? Maybe reduce some workload, but probably not. Okay, so can you give it? Possibly, depends on your protocols. Is it really gonna make a big impact on your patient? Maybe not, it's really hard to say. Okay, but one thing I wanted to say today is that our fear of it in inferior myocardial infarctions, it was there, it was, it was blown out of proportion. But again, still controversial. Okay, and as we go, more evidence is required. But what we know is that it wasn't nearly as a problem as we once thought. That's all I can really say. I'm kind of walking in circles right now because that's kind of the answer that we're getting right now. Is that physiologically speaking, this is why we were afraid. Um, but the evidence didn't line up with this concern unless they're already hypotensive and have huge right ventricular involvement. So I digress off this topic. Okay, so I talked a lot about right ventricular involvement and giving nitro and not giving nitro and if it's possible to use it in this particular case. But the question comes down to how can I know that right ventricle is involved in order to know whether I'm walking into a trap or not? Okay. Well, the answer to that question is that you're going to look at your leads. Okay. Remember that two, three and ABF are looking at the inferior portion of the heart. So they don't get an actual direct view of the right ventricle. They get a bottom butt end portion uh, view of the heart. Okay, so they're only getting kind of like a peripheral view of what's actually going on with that right ventricle. So that's a decent thought. Okay, and that's kind of usually where we start is looking at that. And then we go, okay, how much right ventricular involvement do we have? Well, we do two things. One, we can look at AVL and we can also look at lead one because these both are high lateral leads. So to get that perspective, okay, this is your right ventricle, the AVL and one, both looking at the lateral wall of that right ventricle. Okay, so both AVL and one, if they have SMT depression, that means that they likely are looking at some sort of infarction going on on the lateral wall of the right ventricle. Okay, ABL and one. The other one that is probably the more commonly checked one is V4R. And that's taking V4 from the usual side with your entire 12 lead and swapping it to the exact same location or mirrored side on the right side. And that is going to give you your view of that right ventricle directly straight on. So literally looking at a right ventricle like this. So looking at the anterior portions. This one is actually ST depression. It's flipped. And so it's actually looking at ST depression, which means that we're probably having infarction on the posterior wall of that right ventricle. So it's still indicative of, um, of infarction, even if it is depressed like that. So it's flipped. 
or reciprocal. Okay, so those are the two ways you can really see of how involved your right ventricle is. 2-3 and AVF, getting a very peripheral view using lead one and lead AVL, getting a more direct view and using V4R is getting the most direct straight on view of that heart and that right ventricle. <coughs> Okay, so we've talked about ASA and nitro, we've talked about oxygen, we've talked about all of that. Now, what are some things? We can't really give nitro or say we're gonna avoid it in, in this case, or we give it and it doesn't really have any effect. What are some other treatments that we can do in order to help this patient in getting them to the hospital? Okay, Nate's thinking fluids, okay. Uh, lead four, V4R on the right side is uh, the midclavicular line, okay? Fourth intercostal space or fifth intercostal space. Pain management, okay? Some people are saying Zofran. I'm okay with some Zofran on this patient. Just make sure they don't have any prolonged QT, which there wasn't any. But yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, so let's focus on this. Okay, you have a nauseated patient, so Zofran is totally not out of the question. I'm giving the, I probably would give Zofran to this patient. We've already talked about ASA being a gold standard that goes with every single patient. Uh, nitro is, again, controversial in itself and maybe not have a whole lot of benefit in the inferior myocardial infarction uh, category. But then we have fentanyl and then we have some fluid up here. Now, um, fentanyl is a great pain medication Okay, truly nitroglycerin on, in truth, it's really a pain medication. It's targeting it. Think of it like uh, nitroglycerin being more like Advil for a headache. It's targeting at the point of where you're having your pain, uh, whereas um, fentanyl is more taking away the pain reception of it. Uh, so that's kind of the, how these two are working is nitro, like I said, is more of a, it's pain medication. And if you want to strip everything away from it, um, but fentanyl does that same thing without the negative benefit or negative uh, effects of nitroglycerin. In this particular case is what we need. So fentanyl is a good choice. Morphine's okay, but um, think of it like, um, think of it like fentanyl is just the stronger, better um, medication. It's more synthetic, it's more or more engineered. It's just overall um, provides the same effect as fentanyl, or sorry, as morphine, but um, with less negative um, effects. Okay, so fentanyl is kind of my go-to over morphine in these particular cases. And then finally, I got fluids up here. Now, fluids is an interesting question. Now, I think that fluids are a benefit to these patients because of the physiology that we talked about, where they are preload dependent. So if your patient is hypotensive, <coughs> then I think that fluids are definitely a good first choice in order to increase preload in order to help that blood pressure, okay? So <coughs> would I give fluids to this patient right now? No, because they're not hypotensive. There's no indication to give fluids. If they went hypotensive, then I would likely start fluids first. And then if that failed, then I would go into using my vasopressors and so on and so forth, possibly, and epi drips and those kind of things, and possibly pacing if we have bradycardia with it. But that's kind of the route that I would go down as I would start with fluids if they were indicated, shown with hypotension, and then I would go down that route of continuing to try and get that blood pressure up. So that is my treatment path for these particular patients is making sure I get my ASA, giving them oxygen if they need it, in this particular yes, using fentanyl for pain control, contemplating using nitroglycerin. In this particular case, I might trial it, but maybe not because there's probably not a whole lot of benefit and then give fluids. That's usually my kind of progression with things. Uh, again, check your local protocol on what you're supposed to do. You would find about 50% of the protocols will say that you can give nitro as long as there's no right ventricular involvement. And then the other set of protocols will say, avoid it completely because it's an inferior myocardial infarction. Okay.
another neither camp is right nor wrong uh, for whatever reason they might be saying yes or no. Um, but the fact is, is that it's not as dangerous as we once thought, but it may not be a benefit either. So that's what I've got for you today. Any questions with what we've covered? Okay, I think I see everything there, just making sure I covered everything. Scrolling up a bit, just make sure I didn't miss anything. Why we do a V4R? Because in uh, spe specifically, the V4R is going to give you a direct view of that right ventricle. Lead one and lead v AVL will both give you a pretty good view of it as well. So um, I don't know if there's a massive point to it other than it's kind of just commonly known as that V4R that literally looks at that right ventricle to see if it's truly affected. Will it be posted? Yeah, the, this breakdown will be posted on our website uh, and it'll be available for continuing education. Nasal cannula, non breather. I'm probably going to go nasal cannula um, at, you know, three, four liters because they're already at homo two, two liters. So give them a little extra. Again, they're short of breath. So we might as well maximize the oxygenation if they're short of breath. Don't forget to call in your STEMI alert. I totally agree. Good thing. That's a good point that I did not mention. Don't forget to call the hospital and let them know what you got. All right, I don't see any other questions, so I think that's where I'll leave you for today. Don't forget, you can still get our scenario book online. You can get the ebook or the physical book, as well as the expansion books uh, on the link in our bio. If you're interested in Master Medics and working with us and working with all of our online stuff and using these scenarios in order to better yourself as a paramedic and become um, that person that, you know, that you're striving to be and feeling more confident with patients, we do that. Uh, within our continuing education side of things. And we also have stuff for students as well, which is kind of our bread and butter is working with students, working with schools in order to, again, give you the, in the primary education of being a paramedic and EMT. Uh, so that way you can walk on an ambulance and all your clinicals with confidence. So thanks again for joining me. I'd love to see you on the inside in our premium stuff. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to chat. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye for now.